Welcome, everybody. Um, is the mic on? Can you hear me? Okay. I'm Suzanne Sparge, the Executive Director of 516 Arts. I'm so glad to see you all here in the space. Um, I'm really excited about tonight's lineup of performers. It's going to be great. Um, the exhibition that surrounds you is called Floyd D. Tunson, Son of Pop, and it's a solo show that's a 40-year retrospective of the work of Floyd D. Tunson from Colorado Springs, and it was organized by the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center, so we're very excited to have it here. It'll be up till mid-December, December, so tell folks to, to come. Um, I'd like to thank Billy Brown and his catering company, Cuisine del Corazon, for providing the awesome cookies tonight. And we've got a small crowd, so you can take them with you at the end of the night if there's leftovers. Um, and also thank you to Tractor Brewing for being here downstairs. And anytime you all get some beer and hang out after the show and have a drink and talk with the artists, network, look at the art, stick around. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Idris Goodwin, who's performing tonight, and he's also the MC. Idris worked with us um, in depth during our street arts project, and he curated the Shout Out Festival that happened, that was back in 2010. And it was such a pleasure to work with him, so we're really excited that he's back involved with 516 Arts, and uh, he's here from Colorado. Um, He's a playwright, spoken word performer, and essayist. He's the author of the award-winning, widely produced play, How We Got On, and the Pushcart-nominated essay collection, These Are the Breaks. He's been a writer in residence at the Kennedy Center and has performed on HBO and Sesame Street. Idris teaches performance writing and hip-hop aesthetics at Colorado College. So without further ado, please welcome Idris Goodwin. <laughs> You're going to hear me refer to myself as black. You're going to hear me refer to other members of the black race as black. Now, by race, I refer to skin color. And by skin color, I mean brown. Now, commonly, brown refers to members of the Latino race. And by race, I mean skin color, though in terms of skin color, I mean brown, but not Latino, I mean black. Though it should be noted that Latinos, Indians, Pakistanis, Filipinos, Thai, Vietnamese, Chinese, Japanese, Native Americans, Arabs, pretty much the majority of the world are all different shades of brown. But in terms of members of the brown skin black race, I mean African American. And when I say African American, I don't mean like Barack Obama, whose father was born and raised on the continent of Africa and mother was not. We can assume she's the American part. But Obama is black and not biracial. See, biracial works best if you're like Chinese and Croatian or like Portuguese and Saudi Arabian. Black means you're not white. And if you're not a nationality, then you're black, which means brown, but not Latino. Though it should be noted that many Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Brazilians, Peruvians, etc., refer to themselves as brown, unless, of course, they come from Spain. If they come from Spain, brown usually means gypsy. Now, when I say black, you will surely assume that I am including those from Haiti, Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados, etc., etc., and I do. In terms of race, them niggas is black. They are black, after all, except for the non-black people who live in those countries. But that's an issue of nationality, is it not? Okay, I'm talking about black descendants of stolen Africans who were put on plantations and later migrated across North, North and South America. Not to say that that's the quintessential experience of all brown people, by which I mean black non-Latino Americans who descended from stolen Africans. And Afro-Latinos, you know, black Dominicans like Sammy Sosa used to be. Or black Puerto Ricans like... <laughs> oh. <laughs> Too soon? Too soon? Uh, they are black, brown, black people and both baseball players. Culturally speaking, nationally speaking, ethnically speaking, here's what I'm saying. I'm saying black, I mean brown-skinned Africans and their variants. No, by black I mean descendants of stolen people for whom life is a constant improvisation, whose entire rhythm is in constant debate, demand, and duplication, and whose mere existence is an atrocious masterpiece. By black, I think I mean brown. <laughs> So uh, seven years ago, I moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. I left Chicago uh, with my wife, with my fiance at the time, now my wife, but at the time she was my fiance, and uh, we were living in Santa Fe. And I started working on uh, something I had yet to really understand what it was yet. It was was it a, was it a solo play? I don't know. Was it a collection of essays? I don't know. Was it? I didn't know what it was, but. 
that piece was one of the first pieces that I created for it. Um, and right around when I was working on that, I got uh, the invitation from Suzanne to come and perform here at 516. Um, and so that was seven years ago. Uh, that piece went into this book called These Are the Breaks. It's the first piece in the book, These Are the Breaks. Um, and so it's very apropos for me to come back. Uh, I live in Colorado now, but to be back again performing this piece seven years later uh, in the context of this tremendous exhibit by uh, Mr. Floyd Tunson. Uh, if you haven't spent time checking out the exhibit yet, please do so. Please take your time. Please explore it. Um, this guy is, is, is a brilliant, uh, brilliant artist uh, who's, who's tackling some really uh, hefty subject matter, but I think some very necessary subject matter and doing so with um, just an impeccable uh, understanding of art, of visual art, and all the different ways that you can explore uh, a complex idea. Um, and so when Suzanne and I were talking about this particular event and what we could do, you know, she already had a short list of, of very fabulous performers that you're going to hear tonight. Uh, but one of the things we wanted to do to kind of glue it together is like, well, what's the theme? What's the idea? What are we trying to explore? And I think, you know, on the surface, you look at the pieces and you say, okay, this is a piece about being black. This is a, this is, these are pieces about race. And that is definitely going on. Uh, but the question then becomes, well, what is the takeaway for those who perhaps um, don't have an issue with race, aren't trying to unpack some issue with race, are okay, are like comfortable with where they're at? Um, how, you know, what, what else is there? And I think what is definitely there is this idea of inheritance, right? That he's also interested in exploring what has been passed down and how does the past uh, manifest itself in the present? And what do we carry with us? And why do we carry it with us? Because it's occurred, right? So why do we why do we continue to act upon these paradigms and tropes? What's in the air? What are we what are we doing? And this can be translated across any race, any culture, any gender, is that we're all manifesting every day certain ideas, certain paradigms, certain consciousness that was created before we even existed some heavy shit. So uh, that's what we hoped tonight could be about um, in, in terms of the writers that we have for you this evening. And I'm very excited because all, uh, all of them are people who I've known and worked with, or worked alongside, have been a fan of uh, for many years uh, in my continued travels down here to New Mexico. So y'all are in for a treat. Uh, after we're gonna try, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna run through this night uh, but we're not going to skimp on the dopeness. There's going to be crazy dopeness up in here um, because we want to make sure that there's time for you to have a beer or seven. Uh, explore the. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Um, Lyft, Uber. You know those are. Fine. Um, but to hang out, to to talk to the artists, to explore the work, to drink too many beers. Um, that's that's why we're here to have a conversation in a gallery with all of this amazing art around us. And so we are contributing. We're trying to kick off the conversation. Uh, with a few, you know, with a few gems or, or, or rocks, if you will, depending on your, on your point of view. All right, y'all ready? Yeah. All right, good, I am. And, you know, here and there, I'll, I'll you know, step up and, you know, run my mouth a little bit. You know. um, all right, but uh, so our first performer, first reader, first presenter, first awesome individual uh, is named Tanea Winder. Winder. Uh, I'm going to read the official thing and then I'm going to say the unofficial thing. Tanea Winder is a writer, artist, and educator from the Southern U Duckwater Shoshone? Shoshone and Pyramid Lake, I can't get the, what's his name? Paiute. Paiute Nations. She has taught writing courses at Stanford University, UC Boulder, and University of New Mexico, and is the editor in chief of As Us, A Space for Women of the World, a literary magazine publishing works by indigenous women and women of color. She guests, lectures, and teaches creative writing workshops at high schools, universities, and communities internationally. <coughs> now here's the unofficial thing. Um, part of the challenge of being a creative person or someone who lives by um, their, you know, their pen, their pencil, their paintbrush, their computer, their guitar, or whatever, is there are moments, it's, it's, it's the moments when you're not on stage, it's the moments where you don't have a commission or a grant 
It's the moments uh, in between where you start to question what it is that you're even doing. It's when you get onto Facebook and you see the news feed littering countless, 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 countless atrocities. And you're like, what is my song going to do? What is my poem going to do? What is my literary journal going to do? What is my play going to do? And the great thing is when you have other creative people in your life who are making things, creating, and going beyond just making art, but also creating spaces and, and, and sparking new conversation. And one of the things that I truly admire about Tanea is that she is someone who is not only creating great work, but creating space and creating new spaces, new venues, new avenues for more of the conversation that needs to be happening critically at this juncture. So ladies and gentlemen, here is Tanea Winder. So I'll be sharing just two poems, and um, as you can see, a lot of the pieces, as Idris had mentioned, they use the visual to talk about some of the heavy-handed issues. And for me, in my poetry, I try to incorporate music, whether that's referencing it or actually singing in some of it, so you'll get a taste of both here. So this one is called Teaching the Riff and Being tu Tuned to the Res Blues. Mamas put in Davis during children's naps, time to let the miles of music unfold into sleeping ears. Mamas fear this world where babies are born already confined, waiting in lines of funeral processions, the patient air reinforces lessons of Indians playing along to historically provided scores. The notes read broken livers, diseased hearts and distended bellies in newspapers or television. So babies need the music. The rhythm and blues teach improvisation, the realization life is making and creating. Embedded in the call and response of crying shames reside voracious cold trains, bodies freighted with ache. Mamas want to teach children the rift between what goes on outside these man-made borders, the real world where cars are named after Indians, Navajo, Cherokee, and Tacoma. They know the consequences of the American dream, reality. Just like those cars, they too will end up buried in graveyards if they're not careful sooner than expected. So mamas pray their children dream blues like cracked cups. Broken may not be good luck, but reminds us of survival, an object lesson. If you leave, leave blaring like trumpet dented at all the places to sound your instrument loud for the trail of knowing behind you. History's rifts may be blinding, but babies need reminding when arms are strong enough to unravel muddy waters still needing to be crossed. They are ready to embrace the splitting open like saxophone howling into the white space or ocean, all to empty the darkness inside, or fill it with their own middle ground between the milestones and giant steps they'll want to make in life. So whenever, ba whenever they think blues can be tasted with hands wrapped around a bottle until they're wasted, they'll remember. Their mamas ingrained into their hearts unexpected deviations. Their internal drums will beat louder than the drunken syncopations as they fall into their no longer sweet grass, laying flat on backs, looking up at the Indian and the moon in their sweat-drenched sourness, loving and wondering what's so damn wonderful about our world where we are whole notes unraveling. Mm. Uh, this next one is called Guns and Roses. Before crossing the street to the pass, make sure to look left, then look right, then look left again. There's an oncoming bus named Childhood and puddles of nostalgia ankle deep just ahead, waiting to splash you as cars filled with forgotten dreams wave as they pass by. Look left, look right over your shoulder, there's a familiar melody. He's got a smile that it seems to me reminds me of childhood memories where everything was as fresh as a bright blue sky. Every now and then I step into memory. My favorite one from childhood where I see you smiling, it's precious, hidden in the closet of my mind, tucked away in the back pocket of those worn jeans that fit just right like our fingers interlocking palms, slightly kissing as pages in a book. If you open the story of us, I'm sure it'd start there, back in third grade, us holding hands under the table while we did multiplication. One times one is always one. The first time you kissed me in recess in a game of Red Rover, Red Rover, send me right over into the arms you unlocked from friends to grab me, press lips to cheek. Slobber on my face isn't quite how I imagined it would be. Two times two is four days later we were officially dating, whatever that means in third grade, where we were still learning our times tables. The goal, 
a multiplication of thon, me and you, top two contenders, and to this day, I still believe I should have let you win. I think you needed it more than me back then. Three times three is nine. The age you gave me my first red rose, a candied one I still have never eaten. Four times four, 16, the age when you got your first gun. Five times your, your father is caught cheating on your mother. At six, we stop saying I love you. When they divorce, you cheat on me one times two times three repeatedly. At 18, when I leave you for college, you start drinking. At 21, become obsessed with guns. Because when there's nothing else to do on a reservation, sometimes all you can do is look left and look right into the night. Toss up your empty bottle of 151 into the darkness until finger on gun pulls the trigger. At 22, we shatter. The night you were with my cousin shooting pool, showing off your guns, all it took was one bullet through his heart for us all to break. Now and then, when I see his face, he takes me away to that special place. And if I stare too long, I'd probably break down and cry. Weeks go by. You refuse to see anyone, but when you ask for me, the last thing I expect to see are still rose-red slits over your wrists. I caress the skin with the tips of my finger, hoping to erase the expiration date you saw there and rock you like a child. Oh, 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 sweet child of mine. Oh, 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 sweet love of mine. People still leave red roses and half-empty bottles of 151 on my cousin's grave, and my auntie and uncle still can't bring themselves to say your name or his. Instead, they call him Little One, and I know there must be at least, least 51 other ways to say we were born falling, so I forgive you. When you ask me to always stay, there must be an infinity of days I still want to, wish I had. But as much as I try, sweet love of mine, we thought we mastered time holding hands, but I still can't figure out how to cross over our past. I don't know that I'm going to hear that song the same ever again. Yeah. Um, cool. Thank you, Tanea. Uh, so our next uh, fabulous performer, uh, I'm going to read you the official thing first, uh, and then I'll say a few unofficial parts. Uh, Hakeem Bellamy is the inaugural poet laureate of Albuquerque, serving from 2012 to 2014. He is a national and regional poetry slam champion he is the co-creator of the multimedia hip-hop theater production Urban Verbs, a hip-hop conservatory and theater, which uh, was presented here a couple years ago. Did anybody see that, the Urban Verbs? Yeah. It was dynamite, was it not? Yeah. Well, the directing was really good. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is fantastic. Uh, he facilitates youth writing workshops for schools and community organizations in New Mexico and beyond, uh, and he will perform. Tonight, he will share with you uh, his forthcoming children's book, because uh, he's got many styles like that. Uh, so, Hakeem, hey, fellas, come on in, man. Uh, yeah, get to, we've got chairs, we've mad space over here. It always sucks to come in like late, and then because it's, it's like people are always like, oh, I'm gonna sit on the side that will allow other people who are late to walk across the front. <laughs> Don't feel shame. Don't feel shame. We're here it's Saturday. You can be at the disco. But you're not at the disco. <laughs> And that's a mercy. All right, so when I, I first uh, came to New Mexico in 2005, and, uh, which was almost 10 mother freaking years ago. What? <laughs> that's crazy. Oh my goodness. But I've known Hakeem since then, and uh, I've had the, the pleasure to work alongside him. Uh, you know, in, in many different capacities, but most importantly, I've just I've had the pleasure to just watch and listen um, to his writing, um, just get only more fierce and fierce and clear and insightful. Um, he put out a book recently called Swear, uh, which is with West End Press, which is the one in New Mexico's own. It's a fantastic book. If you haven't read Swear yet, get your life right and read Swear, <laughs> unless you like your life as it is, all wrong and crooked. Um, which, hey, no, ju no, no judgment, no judgment, no shots, no shots, no shots, no shots, okay? It's like AA, no shots. Um, 
But that's just been a, a real pleasure and an inspiration to see. And, and I've, I've viewed and watched the way his work has not only uh, uh, made him the first and very well-deserved poet laureate of this great city who he has always repped hard for, uh, despite being from the East Coast. And I don't know if any of you are from the East Coast, but one of the things people from the East Coast love is to tell you they're from the East Coast <laughs> and to grab the East Coast. No shots. Uh, but Hakeem has always uh, you know, held it down for this city um, and been a champion for this city. Um, and, and not only for himself, but his fellow poets, his fellow artists. I know he's like been in Nepal, he's been in Istanbul, and he's going out and he's representing. He's represent I first came to Albuquerque because of some artists who were traveling and, and brought me here. I had no idea about it. And Hakeem is doing the same thing. He's going around the country, around the world, and, and really representing for the city and the state. And that's like one of the fundamental things about hip hop. I know he's, he's a fellow hip hop kid like me and one of the fundamental things about hip hop is that you represent and you represent for your community and where you come from and he does that to the fullest. Um, so you're in for a treat, ladies and gentlemen, the first inaugural poet laureate of Albuquerque, my man Hakeem Bellamy. It's hard. It's hard to not love that guy. Yeah. So I actually that him mentioning that that was the world premiere of Urban Verbs actually. Well, 2.0, the first version we did uh, in St. Lawrence. But yeah, it was uh, Revolutions International Theater Festival, was our first theater festival, and we had no clue what we were doing. And uh, the the bright idea came and say, why don't we get somebody who actually does hip hop theater since we just call what we're doing hip hop theater. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And we found Idris, and, and we've been inseparable ever since. So thank you for those kind words. Uh, Tanea, my sister, I'm glad you made your flight, because I would have missed all that if you didn't, <laughs> you know, if, if, if you hadn't. So, um, and then, of course, Ramona and Zach, and you'll see. So I, I'm just happy to be here tonight with friends. I got my son. Um, 516 are my friends, too. Full disclosure, I serve on the advisory board. So tell all your friends to come back as often as possible. But um, I got two poems tonight. The first is the children's book. And the second, since I had, like, you know, open mic night on the second piece. I said um, I wanted to do something that really spoke to Floyd's work. So the second piece I'm going to read uh, without introduction, so I'll introduce it now, is um, a piece that I wrote. Man, I've been writing it my entire life. I tried to start writing it after uh, Trayvon, and I couldn't. Like, everything I was writing was just uh, typical, like, angry fare. And, um, but that's how I process. Um, it's better to be angry in a poem than to be angry in real life. But uh, after Ferguson, I, this poem came out, and um, I'll share that one with you afterwards. Um, I had the pleasure of it being published in Al Alternate last week, which is crazy, because I worship at the altar of Alternate and Democracy now. So I got, they published it for me, and then it was published in Truth Out as well. So, But first, the children's book. My publisher couldn't be here tonight, so he told me to tell you that the book is coming out October 31st, I think. There'll be illustrations, which you won't see tonight. And if you like the story, you should try to pre-order it at communitypublishing.org. That's everything you told me to say. Okay. Samuel's story. Yesterday, Samuel decided to kick himself out of school. As you can imagine, the teachers were upset. The problem is, the teachers were upset before he left. His classmates were too. Let me explain. For the past week, the students have been writing stories, stories about who they are. Not just stories about what kind of person they are, but stories about what kind of thing they are. Like, if you could be anything, what kind of anything would you be? And Samuel's classmates had all the best answers. So good, Samuel didn't think that there were any good answers left. Now, Diego said he was a dragon, something about a spell, a sword, and then he turns into a prince. Dora said she was a bee. Samuel thought she was going to say something about turning into honey, which technically would be incorrect, which my mama told me is a fancy word for not right, which is a fancy word for wrong because bees don't turn into honey. They turn flowers into honey, and every first grader knows that. But Dora didn't say honey. She said queen. She's a bee that's going to one day be queen, which is way higher rank than prince. But then again, Dora's smart like that. Darnell said he was a frog, a frog that turns into a prince. And then he and Diego argued for the next five minutes over who thought up being a prince first. <laughs> and then there was Samuel, 
who didn't know a thing about what thing he'd be. I mean, there can only be one prince. Diego and Darnell were already thumb wrestling over that, and Dora, well, she was just smart like that. So Samuel got up in the middle of class yesterday and left, kicked himself out of school. He walked down the road to the park and sat because that's what people do when they really need to think hard. Nothing, no thing. So Samuel paced off into the woods while everyone at school wondered where he went. The teacher called his parents. His parents called the police. The police called the dogs. The dogs called like this. And then they sniffed the floor and took a nap while everyone else worried. An hour later, Samuel came back smiling. Everyone looked amazed. The teachers looked at the parents. The parents looked at the police. The police looked at the dogs and the dogs woke up. Samuel spoke. I know what I want to be. He extended his arm and revealed a caterpillar he found in the woods. Mm -hmm. Even the dogs looked confused. Samuel's father asked him, son, why do you want to be a caterpillar? And Samuel smiled and shook his head no. Then he said, because a caterpillar has dreams, daddy. Caterpillars dream of being butterflies, but I don't want to be a caterpillar, silly. I'm a dream because dreams move slow like caterpillars. But one day after you reach your dreams and take a much needed rest, you hatch into a good story. And one day, I dream of being a good story. That Samuel story. Well, you're in luck. They'll be available just in time for Christmas. <laughs> they make delightful Christmas gifts. <laughs> so uh, this is called uh, AA, or Afro Anonymous, AKA In Recovery, AKA Wardrobe. I am an invisible man. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids. And I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand? simply because people refuse to see me. Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man. Son, if you came up missing, your hood would not be able to find you, unable to pick you out in the crowd or a police lineup, if you made it that far, if they even came looking at all. Don't be anonymous, child. Make sure you stick out like a pair of sore thumbs alongside eight other fingers. Don't fist, don't flinch, even when their fingers curl horizontally at your chest. They won't pull if you don't push. I pray. Get them up, high, as though you could actually reach those pruned dreams above you, rotting on each and every branch of government, like you're the one being robbed of something and everything is suspect. When standing up for yourself becomes a crime, you better stand out. Like, like flannel in the summertime, like black combat boots in a trench coat any time of year, like Stephen frickin' Urkel, pants round your nipples, or they will put shackles around your ankles, hoodies around your neck, flowers around your casket, because they murder more Stefans than Steves every single year. Don't be anonymous, son. Even if your comrades wear fatigues every day in this war zone and call it a wardrobe, you rock those plaid shorts like a tiger with no stripes. Do not enlist in mortal combat with a metropolitan military that can't see the fathers for the G's, the future for the trees. It's open season on hoodies and skinny jeans. The only bulletproof vest I can offer you is beneath this three-piece suit. We've worn these neckties for years because we're less threatening at the end of a leash. Speak jive only as a second language because when in Rome, do as conquered people do. I know, son. Romans who? Empires aren't covered so long after first grade, but it's never too soon to grow up in this backwards world of men in backwards hats getting gunned down in Walmart for brandishing a toy pistol. 
while manufacturers live to brand another day about how lifelike their product is. So authentic, even cops can't tell the difference. So anonymous, even cops can't tell the difference, son. This is not cops and robbers. This is cowboys and Indians. And the only way to not get shot in the back is to dress like a cowboy. This poem is the only arrow pointing you past 19 when their life or pride is in danger. They cannot tell the difference between you and the criminal record. Wicked, wicked criminal record. Wicked, wicked criminal record they've been bumping in their patrol car all day the gangster rap videos they imagine on loop in your brain every time you open your mouth with no sir they can't tell just like mothers trying to identify the mutilated bodies of their babies pulling stefan's personal effects out of a footlocker of air force ones and phoenix suns jerseys like it's a police lineup i will donate your carefully creased curb costume to a pimps and hoes party at a fraternity you will never get in at a college i'm determined to get you into in one piece this retired uniform designed to help you survive these gang infested streets is in need of a facelift to help you survive a more lethal form of thuggery because your tank tops will never top their tanks. If wearing a white flag were enough, I would drape you in that, but it looks too much like a coroner's blanket. An officer PTSD might mistake you for a front line in Iraq. Take off that bullseye of conformity, son. That bullshit dream of equality. You can't wear whatever you want in this country that blames women for their own rape because of what they didn't have on. You tuck your blackness into your bloodstream like a white gold chain in the most dangerous part of town because the bullets pierce bubble goose parkas leaving puddles of black boyhood flooding our sewers, and I'm sorry, but I'd rather have you crying than leaking on your way home. So you will settle for being the preppiest kid in school. Wear your culture like a butt-naked emperor, like an invisible man. They will see you when it's convenient. Be on your Birkenstocks and Brooks Brothers during the next manhunt when boys are fair game. So whatever you do, don't be anonymous. When you go back out to that corner, be the duck wearing a Labrador retriever costume and a flock of geese. At least you know they won't shoot you today. And hey, if you're lucky, they might even housebreak you and take you home. Woo! You know, church ain't only on Sunday, y'all. Sometimes it's on Saturday night. Amen. It's too real. Um, yeah, we are honored to uh, be here tonight to be having this conversation. Um, and we appreciate the call put out by uh, Brother Floyd Tunson uh, via his phenomenal work. And uh, I just wanted to give uh, a big round of applause, a big, a sincere one. Uh, a sincere one uh, for our dear friends here at 516 Arts for not only bringing Floyd's work here, but organizing uh, a series of events um, around the work um, and, you know, to enrich this community and also to contribute to this international conversation that's going on. So I just want to really recognize 516 Arts. All right. We're going to move this thing right along. Now, our next, uh, this is something very exciting. We have uh, a duet going on. We have two people working together in concert. It's going to be crazy. Uh, it's going to require just a moment of setup. All right, so while they set up, uh, it'll only take a minute or two. So if you want to need to run to the restroom, if you want to move you know your seats or whatever like that if you want to grab a beer very fast but it's just we're talking two maybe three minutes um do that we're going to come back for our next uh performers and i'm going to introduce them now actually no i'm going to wait till they set up and then i'm going to introduce them how's that sound all right great so here's what's going to happen three minutes i'm going to turn the music on it's going to be like musical chairs when you hear the music go off <laughs> Come on. Okay? Like the apostle Michael Jackson said, chum on. When you hear the music block. Alright, so quick round of applause for our first two performers. Alright folks, we're back. 
chamar um. <laughs> Lots of fantastic snacks, beverages. This is great. I see people sitting in different seats now. <laughs> Big fan. You having a good time so far, folks? Yeah. Yeah. Right on fire. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I am too. All right, so I'm very excited about what's about to happen up in her. Um, so first off, uh, I want to talk about Zach Freeman. Uh, Zach Freeman is an accomplished beatboxer who merges hip hop, folk, acapella, and electronica. He records his voice on an electronic device, creating drums, bass, and harmony tracks. He then sings live over the sounds. He prefers performing at elementary schools to the club circuit, spreading a message of peace, community, and social justice. Though they do need to hear you at the club. They need to hear you. They need you. They need you. They do. I love you. I love you too, buddy. Um, so that, that actually was my informal introduction to Zach Freeman, was uh, that they need him in the club. But seriously, in all seriousness, um, Zach Freeman, is, to me, um, I, I, I love music. I, I, uh, I, w I actually secretly wish that I was actually a musician. And I always tell people the reason I rap is because I can't sing. And the reason I write plays and the reason I you know, basically do everything uh, and write essays and teach and all this kind of stuff is because I can't play the piano. And I would quit all those things if I could play the piano. Um, and so, and, but the reason I love music so much is because, and Zach truly exemplifies this, is that the music lives in the person and the instrument is merely the conduit. And, and with Zach, when you watch him perform, you know, it's just, you're just getting all of the stuff, all of the goodness and the energy that just lives inside of him uh, through, his, through his sounds. And it's just, it's a really just a great experience. And no matter what kind of day you've had today or what is weighing on you, um, you know, when you hear Zach's sonic landscapes that he just creates, just, what, huh, Como? Uh, it just kind of restores you. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, Ms. Ramona King uh, is a new friend, um, and so I don't have a lot of informal words to say, but I will say this, is that her necklace game is top notch, okay? <laughs> really, her whole situation is something that you need to lay eyes on. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say about that. But the street, but listen, you know, she's friends with all my friends, and so it feels like family already. Uh, we might could be kin. Um, but Ramona King is a storyteller who collaborates with beatboxer Zach Freeman on their own unique form of spoken word and music performance. King has been performing nationally for over 15 years. She conducts workshops and gives presentations on embracing change, amen, and challenges for empowered living. She performs folklore and original stories in movement, dance, and song, creating an atmosphere of playful wisdom and social justice. She also wants me to make sure that you know that she is a mother of three. Yes, indeed. Um, also, you, sir, I've not met you. You're not on my docket. What's your name? What's your name? What's the album? All right. New friend. This is my man, Adolf Hillary. That's that right? All right, he just joined the band. Uh, yeah, we're going to take this thing on the road. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for this fabulousness that's about to go down. Let me just take a moment to let you know that uh, that brother um, Adolf came, he, he, he sat behind me and said, uh, you need a drummer. And I said, well, we got beatboxing. He said, I guess we could use some drumming. So he let me know he's here to feel the spirit. Whatever happens, it's going to happen. <laughs> Let's give him a big hand. All right. Zach, how are you doing over there? I'm okay. Can you give us a little? Can you give us a little sound? Let them know what we're about to hear. <laughs> Can 
So we have been a little bit on, uh, you know, we're not quite sure what story we're going to tell you. I don't know if that, it's feeling like uh, maybe the boy cried wolf. Yeah, that you think that'll work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Samuel and the boy who cried wolf. We're going to do the boy who cried wolf. All right. And I tell this story in honor of all of our sons, our daughters, but specifically our sons, who've been targets, as Tunson has shown us in Hearts and Minds, in the Hearts and Minds piece downstairs. They was a little boy, shabang, shabang. Who wants a machine to bet? He wants them every day. To bet, to bet, and has no time to play. To bet, to bet. Well, what is day? The boy he got no sleep. The boy he cried, whoop, ba, whoop, ba.
I said, um, you know, make sure you, uh, you know, after we're done here, you stick around, you check out the art, talk to the artist, stop by the merchandise table, maybe pick up a compact disc or a book, uh, something of that nature. Be nice. Take home a piece of the night. And uh, hey, Jason, I have a question. Talk to me. I wanted to see if Zach wanted to play a piece for us. Yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. Zach Freeman, we need to so long.
just another price tag. Put that back into the bag, y'all. If you need another hamburger or another French fry, <laughs> another freaking frozen drink, because that stops us all from thinking about the things that really matter now we're watching ourselves. It's like obesity is not just another unit. It's a way of life. So just look at your wife and your kids and your car and your dog. It's not far for you to see that. I'm not really trying to lie about macho man. Size is really us. You can't believe that it happened to you. You woke up one day and you found out that it didn't let you have space. It was all about, it's like air we breathe. It's like songs we see. It's like lives we front. It's so things we want we can't be any more useful than we really were when we were just babies. Aww. <laughs> He didn't have any money. The city, they were kind of trying to kill him because he was like writing about like all the people beating up the Chinese immigrants and they were like, Who, what's wrong with you? Um, and so he was, he was kind of ostracized and he was depressed and he was suicidal. And they said, you know what you need to do, Mark Twain? Uh, why don't you just, you're a funny guy, you're an interesting guy, why don't you just get on stage and talk? I bet people would pay money for that. And, um, and that's where it began for him. And then he started writing books and then he was a big time and then he started blowing all his money on weird inventions that nobody wanted, he lost all his fortune. And so he went back on the road again, doing spoken word essentially, went on, at like 63, went on this big world tour. And then it all went down, he came home and his daughter died of some illness, it's a very sad story. Uh, but the, the fact that he, even after all of his fame, it was that, that thing, that place that he started, he held very close to it and continued to practice it. Um, and for me, everything is martial arts metaphor, so, uh, <laughs> I stay doing this rap shit because uh, it's, it's just, it's essential. So anyway, so I'm working on this seventh album. It doesn't have a title yet. I launched an Indiegogo campaign uh, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so if you like, I'm gonna give you a sample. This is something that's not ready to come out of the oven yet, but uh, Zach Freeman inspired me, Hakeem inspired me, Tanae inspired me, Ramona King inspired me, 516 inspired me, Floyd Tunson inspires me. And so I wanna share this with you all. Uh, and if you like it, maybe uh, check out some more of you just go with music. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you just go home and eat some uh, cured meat. Uh, but that's not my business. True story. Is that okay? Can I, can I, okay, all right. 
Here we go. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for listening. I'm closing us out. I'm taking us home yeah. with a with a song uh, from the seventh Idris Goat album that does not have a title. Here we go. The song does the song itself has a title. The song is called The Song Speaks for Itself. So music help you get through all of the harsh spells, realities and casualties on our black males. Keep it fair, but ain't nobody equal. Try to keep it cordial with the what up, nice to meet you, but some shift shape like that metal man in T2. Raise your voice to the hand, the hand's gonna beat you. Every week in the news leaking, the kid left bleeding, no longer breathing. When people speak up, they catch a beating. This current regime is too comfortable, they need unseat. And that's real. And I don't think that a hook's gonna help. The verses speak for itself. Yeah. The first verse speak for itself. So make some noise right now if my message is felt. Yeah. Who gonna help? The verses speak for itself. Second verse will speak for itself. So make some noise right now. Yeah. First black president, all white Congress. You already know what it is, so let's be honest. And where's the progress? A whole bunch of nonsense, and it's been on since. First slave ships unloaded their cargo. Masters of fiction, fake pictures like Argo. Trees of the doggo, etc. and so forth. It's hard to smell the roses when you ain't got no porch. Instead of getting medieval with the pliers and blowtorch, you take the social media, launch out your thought. The platform is owned, they pay for your soapbox. Even the cloud you're sending files to for monitoring, regulated, sanitized, monitored. The life you fantasize, the life you fetishize is a bigger vision than your pockets can't monetize. And I don't blame you for needing to escape. The system isn't stretching any day it can break. And every institution out here making mistakes. Look to your old and the young and see what your country embrace. And every day out there's no rest for rage till we live up to the promise on the Constitution page. I don't think that a hook gonna help. The verses speak for themselves. Second verse speak for itself, so make some noise right now if my message is felt. Yeah. The hook gonna help. The verses speak for itself. Second verse speak for itself, so make some noise right now. Yeah. We care about your release date, we in a police state. They be talking about weight, but we ain't at the cheesecake factory. You can't ask for no justice humbly, quietly. Riots brewing through every single artistry of rap is the artistry of rep and reality. And everything else is just a flat out fallacy. So if you're a receipt rapper, reading off your recent purchases, you only operate on one of many surfaces. I pose a simple question, what your purpose is? It only sound like a bunch of pissed off porpoises with a chip on their dorsal fins. Swim in different channels, I don't follow the fish, I stand up like a mammal. Concern myself with only matters of the people. Pills and guns is cool, but ethnic studies is illegal. I'd rather have you numb, holding a desert eagle, than walking unified like deserts, walking with the Hebrews. I don't think that a hook gon' help. The verses speak for themselves. The whole song speak for itself, so make some noise right now if my message is felt. The hook gon' help. The song speak for itself. The song speak for itself, make some noise right now if my message is felt.